The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret society, to secret oath, and to secret proceedings. Waking humanity, one soul at a time. This is The World You Don't Know Radio Show with your host, Nick O'Connell. Now, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're very welcome along to this week's edition of The World You Don't Know. Myself, Mick O'Connell. Um, I have a guest lined up. I've got Alan from OAM coming on. We're going to have a little bit of a natter about um, stuff that's going on around the world and here at home in Ireland. Now, one of the big stories, I suppose, that, in my opinion, has been covered up over the last few weeks is the Morris McCabe scandal that sprung up many months ago but has been back in the media over the last couple of weeks. And that story was gaining good traction. You know, I think the upper echelons of Angara Sheikh Khan were getting quite worried about what was going on. And even Tusla, for the part that they played in labelling Morris McCabe a child abuser, basically, trying to completely tarnish his reputation. Now, Morris McCabe, as you will know, was one of the Gardaí, along with John Wilson, who blew the whistle on the penalty point scandal on judges getting their penalty points wiped and, you know... Guards wiping penalty points for people. Now, John Wilson was on OEM radio um, not so long ago, and he was talking on OEM about what what's actually going on with the with the poll system, with um, with the guards in general, and how they look upon society, and you know, general members of the public and stuff like that. And it was quite. Um, I won't say a harrowing show, but it, was, it certainly put the hairs up in the back of my neck to think that this is the way they're actually behaving. But. Um, Morris McCabe, as I said, he was one of the, the guard, and he's been since um, vindicated of any wrongdoing on his part. I mean, the guy was basically lambasted by the upper echelons of Angarda Sheikh Khan. How dare he speak out of tone, as it were? But what he was doing was he was just exercising his conscience, which is, you know, what any decent human being would be doing, exercising their conscience. I mean, I've come across guards who don't have a bloody conscience at all, they're just robots. But um, he's one of the exceptions, as John Wilson is an exception to the rule as well. And they seen that this was wrong and it was a crime, so let's expose it. You know, we're supposed to be here to prevent crime, let's expose crime in, in all its forms and corruption. And that's what they were doing, and of course, um, the system turned on the moment against them. And, as I said, the Morris McCabe story was gaining good traction until the Tune Baby scandal arose, and that took... Sent a stage then on all the headlines, and you can I'm not, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the tune baby scandal shouldn't be in um, headline news. Of course, it should be headline news. But the other thing that should be kept in the headlines as well is the Morris McCabe issue because that is an extremely serious issue. Here we have a police force in the country who are meant to be above reproach, and yet they're not. So um, in saying that, I've got Al coming on. That's what we're going to be talking about. So I'll go straight to Al. Good evening, Al. Good evening, Mick. How are you doing? I'm not too bad. And how are you? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. Playing catch-up at the moment. Catch-up. I mean, listen, you're very welcome on to the show, Alan. Um, appreciate you coming on at short notice. Um, as usual, I don't really give you that much notice, but you're always a gentleman, you're always willing to come on, and that's great. Um, I don't know if you were listening to what I was just saying there about Morris McCabe. Um, now, I don't know an awful lot about the case either. I, I've like, skimmed across the headlines and stuff like that and what's going on. Um, you've had John Wilson on your show, and he gave an extremely revealing interview and it was an absolutely um, groundbreaking interview, in my opinion. It was a brilliant interview, and very well done to yourself and um, Steve for pulling that interview off with John. Um, Morris McCabe was in a similar boat to John Wilson. Um, the two guards who had a conscience and decided to blow the whistle on what they seen as a corrupt system, and they got vilified for it. But as his case was making good traction in the mainstream media, out came the big tomb story. And the tomb story is something that the state have known about, in my opinion, anyway, since 1961 and, be, and before that. When that building was knocked down in 1961, they knew bloody quite well what was buried beneath that place. I'm sure they knew. But um, they've been covering it up ever since, along with a lot of other stuff, as we well know. But um, it's the way the mainstream media behave. When a big story hits the headlines, like the Morris McCabe story, they find something else to, bur to bury it with. Now, I'm not saying they find something insignificant to bury it with. Yes, usually they do use an, insignific uh, an insignificant story. This time it's a, a bigger story. Again, it's a really harrowing story of all these babies that um, have died, or, you know, under whatever circumstances they did die in. But um, I can't help thinking, like, the, the, the media in this country, they're an absolute joke at this stage. Definitely. With the, the reporting that they do, and again, it's all kind of, they're all in each other's pockets. And we, I mean, we all know that. It's all propaganda. Mm. And I think, uh, Mick, do you remember when, I'm, I'm not sure there was 9-11 or 7-7, 
when a lady was caught um, saying, making a, an email that was sent or a statement that was made is now's the time to, 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 to give out some bad news because people would be so focused on what happened in 9-11 or 7-7. I was not too sure which instant it was. <laughs> That and it's the the, the counter worry or the counter problem, and it, this is all people have to understand that. It, I, and I'm coming from the corporate world, and I'm speaking from the corporate world. There's a lot of PR and marketing. Loads of this goes in the background. Loads of training goes in. Loads of man management. You have management consultants come in. Um, how to wear? I, I, I don't know whether it was on your show. I mentioned that maybe it was on o, OEM. That you know when if you look at our leaders. Um, and I have a picture when our leaders like Cameron or Kenny and stuff like that. They go around and they have the shirt pulled up. Now, when you pull your shirt up past your elbow, you're one of the workers. But if you if you pull your shirt up below your elbow, you're one of the supervisors. You're saying you're making a statement. I'm in charge. I know what I'm doing. I'm in control. Where if you pull your shirt up over your elbow, you're just one of the workers. And this is all the psychology and all the PR and marketing that these agencies are hired by politicians to teach them all this, mm. how to talk, how to speak, what to wear, how to wear it. All these things go on in the corporate world and politics is no different. So and the fact that, back to, um, you know, they, they changed the subject to the tune babies because, you know, the whole whistleblower thing was getting out of hand. Mm. So they needed to make a switch and that's what they did. Yeah, I, I, and that's exactly how I seen it. And like I said, Al, don't get me wrong. You know, the tune baby scandal, that has to be out in the open. You know, that needs to be investigated and investigated openly and transparently. But I couldn't help thinking at the time, I mean, they've known about that scandal for a long, long time. You know, they couldn't have picked a better and more opportune moment to bring it back to the surface again, to bury what could essentially bring the whole bloody government down. Well, again, you know, we've said since 1922, all we've had is Tweedledum and Tweedledee mm. since then. And nothing ever gets fixed because they don't want it to get fixed. Yeah, it's not supposed to be fixed, is it? It's, it's meant to be broken. It's not supposed to be fixed. They, they're at the top, you know, of the hill and they're in charge and they like the way things are working at the moment. So they keep things the way they're working and they give you the, Asha, what can you do? And we can't do this and we can do, can't do that. They can never, they never have enough money. They can't print money. They have machines to do it. So they can't find the money to help the people, but they can find the money to do other things. One of the things that Damien English is a TD in County Mead, and something that I mentioned on OAM um, was that he received funding from the government, uh, something like 300,000 euros, for getting the uh, Solstice Theatre in Navan refurbished. And I left a message on his Facebook, and I wasn't derogatory, anything like that, but I said, I cannot believe that you as a politician are going to spend 300000 allocated by the government on refurbishment of a theatre when we have homelessness and evictions going on in the country. I, I mean, it's just a beggar, beggar's belief that the, the, what, what's going through these people's minds. Mm. But, you know, you have to remember that the majority of the TDs, if not all of them, are not business people. And we can see that with Donald Trump. Now, people like him or love him. He's a businessman. Yeah. And a lot of the things he's done, he has approached from a business point of view with a business head on. And I'll have to give him, I have to agree with him on that. Because the things he's done, it will, it, it's exactly what a businessman would do. It's not what a politician would do. Yeah, no, I don't know and if you've seen recently with Donald Trump. He, he wouldn't shake hands with Angela Merkel. I mean, even when he had Enda Kenny in the White House the other day, he was being extremely sarcastic towards him. I don't know if Enda picked up on it, but I certainly did. Well, to be honest with you, Enda Kenny, I mean, Enda Kenny is so stupid. You know, you don't go in, you don't go over to somebody's house and then insult them in their own house. Yeah. You know, and this is how stupid Enda Kenny is. You know, um, and of course, you know, to bring over the shamrock and um, Trump probably thinks, what do we do? Eat us? Smoke yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, every year this is done, you know, and it's a jolly for, you know, the politicians. Seriously, I, I, I often say to my son, and you've got kids as well, and I say to him, you know, you're, he's 15 now, he's coming up to 16. And I say, at, at this moment in time, you won't understand what's going on in Ireland and the country. But when you get older, when you get to be an adult in your 30s and 40s, you will look back and hopefully the country will be in a better state. And you'll think, how were the people so stupid 
to vote for these clowns and put them in and keep doing the same thing over and over again. Well, isn't that the indoctrination, you know, that goes back generations? You know, these people just, I don't vote for a start. I'm not even registered to vote. I have no intentions of ever registering to vote. I think if anybody votes, well, then you're voting for a system that is going to screw you over one way or the other anyway and you've no one else to blame but yourself for getting involved in that system in the first place but unfortunately the majority of people in this country as you well know well have this false belief in their heads that by getting out and voting they can affect real change mm. but yet nothing ever changes nothing it just gets worse and worse and worse I mean before the end of 2020 this country will have paid over to the European Union the tune of 58 billion plus interest yeah, no, it's it's just ridiculous. It's it's beyond belief what we're doing and the money that's handing out. And even the odious debt that we paid in 2008, um, you know, at the end of the day... Sorry, that's my, my son saying my phones are going off. No problem. Um, the, um, at the 2008, the debt that we paid over to Europe, and that was an odious debt. We didn't have to pay that. There was no contract. Yeah. So basically... Um, we shouldn't have paid it. But again, it was the oligarchs again, you know, turning around and saying that had, that had to be paid. Ireland was doing well up to 2008. If we didn't pay that debt, we would have been fine. And what, but, I ask you, uh, like, what do you think may have been said to those politicians that were, uh, you know, on that famous night back in sept September 2008, what do you think might have been said to those politicians for them to basically sign our rights away? Uh, basically, they were probably told that look, don't worry about the people. We'll take care of you. We'll take care of you guys. We'll give you a little like golden handshake and, and a couple of quid and um, to stay quiet and to tow the rope. Um, and it's all part of the bigger picture. So they will be probably thrown. They, they might have been thrown sweeteners, or they would have been just convinced that what they were doing was right. And they would have been probably given a lot of BS but, um, to explain why they, you know they, it was right to do that. Yeah. And um, no, I do. I did hear a rumor about Brian Lennon. I'm not going to say. I was just going to mention him just now. Um, Enoch Crane actually mentioned him down in uh, Waterford a couple of weeks back when he gave his hour-long speech. He mentioned Brian Lenahan and the bailout, and he said, I think his words were something like, "Brian Lenahan looked like one of the most worried men." he'd ever seen, like, you know, you could see that look in his face that he had done something awful, and he knew it, and not long after that, as we all know, Brian Lennon passed away, sadly. Yeah, well, as I say, I'm not going to go into speculation um, as to what the rumour was regarding Brian Lennon, but um, we, I was told from somebody who found out from an insider, it's, I suppose you'd call a third party, that he was um, threatened because of something personal in his life, um, and um, so he was kind of forced into doing what he had to do. Now, is that true? I don't know. I'm getting a third hand. It's like the ubiquitous um, videotape gets mentioned. Well, look, you know, look what we the, have on you, you know. Thing. We're going to be talking about Morris McCabe, but this is the thing, and people need to realise, the five things that they'll try and get you on is sex, drugs, religion, money, or... Um, Politics, yeah. right? So, so they'll try and wh whoever you are, they'll say well, like Morris McCabe. Oh, can we stitch him up? Can we plant some dodgy photos on your computer? Or can we do? Can we send you into a, somebody into a hotel room and get them drunk, lie them on the bed, throw in a minor, take a few photos, and say we're going to blackmail you? This is the dirty tricks they do. Yeah, and no. it, it, Morris McCabe is a typical example that he blew the whistle. He was coming out with the information. They said, we have to get something on him. If not, we're going we're gonna to set him up um, and we're going to do something because we need to drag his name in the dirt and get people thinking and asking questions. And, and this is all it takes. Now, we had Owen Pardew on our show, um, the guy who's the public um, official uh, watchdog. And he was the guy taking videos of the guards in Dublin. Um, is and this the American know, guy, is it? Sorry? Is that an American guy? Yeah, well, yeah. he's Irish, but he has an American Amer accent. I know the guy you're talking about, yeah. And uh, he, he was on our show, and uh, basically something happened to him, which destroyed his life. Um, whatever they tried to do, I went to court, and I was thrown out of court. Um, but it destroyed his life. Um, and this is what they do. They they try and um, set you up and try all different things. And um, it's just disgraceful. It really is. These are the people who people are looking up to. Yeah. And you have to lead by example. You know, like managers and corporate companies, I, I've always said it. You have to lead by example. 
how can you, and you have this massive hypocrisy right through the whole system, religion, uh, the medical system, the guards, the pol- politicians, it's all hypocrisy. Yeah. Do as I say, not as I do. And this is what I was saying just before you come on the air there about Ungarda Shea Now, I know plenty of guards and they're decent human beings, and don't get me wrong, I know plenty who are not, but um, they're meant to be, as our national um, peacekeeping force, they're meant to be above reproach. It's end of. You know, if you're not above reproach, don't become a guard. Simple as that. You know, well, don't get me wrong. I know everybody has failings. You know, you know we're humans. We're all you know frail in different areas and stuff like that. But they have to be seen to be above reproach, and they have to behave above reproach. But they have to lead by example. Exactly. How the hell will do? Do they expect people to respect them if they don't? You know, if they don't do what they're preaching, if they don't practice what they preach. Mm. Yeah, it's 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 that fundamentally it's that simple if you want us to respect you then you be a good example and lead by example but they don't now i'm not going to tar them all with the same brush the likes of john and morris and the other guys have come out and you know they have some integrity ter- integrity for coming out and doing what they're doing and yeah. fair play to them but we heard that some of the older guards are saying they don't like the new recruits that are coming into the guards because they're basically they're, they want to drive cars fast and beat people up illegally. Yeah, you know they don't want somebody to have a conscience. They don't want somebody to have empathy. They just want drones to do what they're told and um, you know maybe probably get revenue in yeah. because uh, revenue you know tickets, speeding tickets, and all this stuff all makes money. Crime yeah. nah, do, doesn't pay. Doesn't pay the government. It doesn't at all. Ah, listen, I'm going to go to an ad. So do you mind hanging up for a minute too? No problem, folks. I'll be back in a couple of minutes. For I'll talk to you very soon. You're listening to Lizzie Side on ninety six point four FM. Now, folks, you're very welcome back. Are ah, you still with me? I am indeed, Mick. That's yeah. brilliant. Um, listen, I'm going to move on from Morris McKay now. I, I think we've said uh, a, a fair bit about that. and You know, the system, as, as you well know, Al, it does need to be cleaned up. I mean, it's, it, it is getting ridiculous that when you have people like Morris McKay and John Wilson who do come forward and do the decent thing, that the system sets out quite blatantly to bury them. And I, I'm glad, in a way, that, you know, the government and the system have been exposed in that regard, and long may it continue. I mean, there's some good people out there trying to expose corruption. I won't mention any names right now, but there are a lot of people out there, as you well know, Al, who are exposing corruption in this country, and I think the system is going to come crumbling down sooner rather than later, to be honest with you. It's... Because I'm, I'm saying, like, you know, with people we know from my own stuff like that, I won't mention his name, um, I think you know who I'm talking about, but when we see what they're doing, what I see is what we didn't see 20 years ago, that the ordinary guy on the street was getting out and calling these people out, and there are people out there now who are actually doing it, so hopefully it'll continue, and it will encourage more people to come out who are working within the system to come out and basically squeal on the system, because that's the only way it's going to get cleaned up. Yeah, totally. Well, the one thing that... Um, we we know from history is that any secret society that has been exposed has never lasted. Yeah. Um, and and that's what it's all about. Now, if you mix up the fact that there's whistleblowers coming out telling information, and then there's people actually waking up at, across the board, not just in Ireland but globally, people are beginning to wake up and ask questions. They're seeing the corruption. It's right in their face. And of course, there are certain pockets of the mainstream media now coming out and revealing certain things. I mean, one of the things that we talked about um, last night was BBC.com. Um, and uh, they reported a, a panorama program. I'm just going to uh, call up here and um, I'll just uh, tell you now. It was basically got to do with the comic relief and the money um, going into uh, arms and tobacco shares rather than going to where it's needed. Uh, the third world countries. Now, I do believe Enor Crane did some research into this. I'm sure others have done. And um, I am a big believer of Charity Begins at Home. Mm. And you don't know if you're paying that three euros a month, whether it's going to the, the, the people that need it. So I would prefer to work with the charities like You're Not Alone, which OIM do. And you can see, I've, I've been there, I've seen the, the stuff that we've, we've helped out with and the, you know, the fundraisers we've done with sleeping bags and stuff like that. And being in, in, in the central bank in Dublin with the You're Not Alone charity and the food and the, the sleeping bags being handed out to the homelessness, yeah. that's brilliant. That's exactly where, you know, when you raise money or you do, do, donate money, that's, that's where I think it should go. And you can see exactly where that money is going. You know it's actually helping people who are on the streets. Totally, totally, big time. And I think that people have to focus on that. And I know it's terrible, but them third world countries, 
they don't need vaccines because you get the advert saying three euros a month will help get pay for vaccines for this group of people. They don't want vaccines. They want food. They want shelter. Yeah. They want a life. They don't want vaccines. I mean, I even seen that today in the headlines now. There's a lot of Hollywood stars now are getting together to uh, raise funds to prevent famine. There's, you know, in Africa, there's more famines are on the way now over in Africa. You know, I, I, I remember watching Live Aid in 1984. And, you know, Jesus Christ, have they not sorted this bloody problem out yet? You know what I mean? No, listen, I've, I've had um, uh, relatives who came over, who uh, moved over to the UK in the, the 1950s. And he said, even then, in the 1950s, they were still doing the same thing. Talking about starving so, African babies. Uh, just just the, the, the same thing, like choker boxes. Yeah. I mean, when you were in school, Mick, like me, we had choker boxes. Yeah. We're still having choker boxes. Does that not say something to people that the money's not going to the, to the right people? But it's obviously not making that much of a difference if the situation is still the same in these countries. Exactly. Sure. One one time I seen um, uh, Tony Blair when he was in, he donated seven seven point five million to a country uh, for funding for um, to help the people, and the president of the country took the money and did up his palace with it. And yet they still handed that money over to him. They, they handed the money over. Well, they've said, here's 7.5 million. Go and help. Use this to help your people. And the president said, thank you very much. And then he went and up, upgraded his palace with it. And you know, the ironic thing about that is he probably used a lot of Western companies to do the work for him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is why people need to kind of, you know, cop on now and, and start looking at charity being that begins at home. Start putting your money and your help and your energy into local charities, local groups that can help out, that you can see that they're working and helping out. Yeah. Because that's what it's going to be. We're all going to go back um, to community. We have to go back to community. And with the Ubuntu movement, which me and you, Mick, we've, we were down in Waterford, um, and Ubuntu was down there, mm. and I spoke to the guys from Ubuntu. And it's like an advanced form of time banking. Um, and it's a, it's a great idea. They've been gifted the 54-acre farm. I think it's in Tipperary. And um, Michael Challenger is, there's groups around in all different countries setting up and doing this timeshare um, or time banking system, uh, which is, it's going to be, uh, I think it's going to be very good. Um, I'd like to see, I'd, I'm going to get the guys on the show. I'm sure you will make as well. I will. I'd love to, um, yes, I definitely would. And, and we'll, we'll talk about um, this uh, Ubuntu system and wake up people to it. Um, because the one thing I've noticed as well, Mick, is that um, there's so much new information coming out. Things are being revealed. New technology is coming out. Last night on, on our show, you probably heard their show. I don't know whether you... I didn't listen to it yet. I, know. I mean, I was okay. in work today and I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet. So I it's did share it. I have no, shared it around Facebook earlier on, so... Yeah, you did. Great. Thanks for doing that. Um, the Spooky 2 machine, mm. which is a self-healing, you can use it to heal yourself. Um, so a bit like the Pain Genie, but it's a bit more advanced because it can do a lot more ailments. Um, so all this tech is coming out, and it's brilliant to see. We just have to, you know, get people to wake up because that's the barrier. You know, we have to wake people up to say, look, just because the doctor says you have cancer doesn't mean you have to have chemo. You can go off and get something else and get another treatment. Yeah. And yet they will tell you, I mean, I, I went to my own doctor once with um, high blood pressure and he wanted to put me on medication. I said, no, can you exp uh, describe an alternative for me? He says, there isn't one. I said, how do you mean there isn't one? He says, oh, no, that's all hocus pocus, that stuff. So hang on a minute. I said, that stuff has been around for thousands of years. Your stuff has been around a hundred years. I says, I think your stuff was hocus pocus. And I didn't take the medication off. And I, said, I went away and I learned that if you get celery and liquidize it and drink it, it's good for your blood pressure. So I started doing that and my blood pressure came down. Brilliant. And, uh, you know, statin drugs, they're actually saying that statin drugs are a waste of time. They don't work. Yeah, I mean, that's been around for a long time, that, that rumour about statin drugs not working. But uh, my mother, mother had high blood pressure and she was on medication for that and she had high blood pressure. You know, so what gives? It never worked. Exactly. So uh, what I'd say to people is um, try and get um, try and be get go for natural food as much as you can. And then obviously something that we've we've mentioned on the show before that. The, the longer the actual um, best buy date, the worse it is for you. So if you buy something and it's out of date, you know, or goes off within a, a few hours, that's going to be much better for you than something that's going to last two or three years. Yeah. So the, 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 the longer the best buy date, um, the worse it's going to be for you. Well, I think that kind of food is not real food anyway, because it obviously has chemical additives to it to stop it going off. And that's not a natural process. Food is meant well, to go off fairly quickly. 
Well, Steve said last night that he he got his daughter um, some cheese one time, and uh, he looked at the ingredients on the cheese, and it had cheese flavouring in it. And Steve said, well, if it has cheese flavouring in it, if you take away the cheese flavouring, what, what, what will it be like? It'll be probably just like plastic. Yeah, God. And, and you have to think of that, that uh, movie with Charlton Heston, Salute 7. Um, a Silent Green, sorry. Silent, oh, Silent Green. Green, yeah. Where, um, obviously, uh, it's in the future and food is very scarce. And, um, well, I won't go into, I won't spoil the story, but uh, people need to have a read of that um, or have a look at that movie and then you'll understand what uh, where we might be going. Because at the, at the moment, the way the world is, there's just so much going on. I mean, even today, I got a message through one of our contacts about things that are going on and just to be aware that, you know, um, things are happening in a good way. But this is the thing. What people don't realise is they turn around and say, Oh, we need to expose this. We need to, you know, get this out there. We need to get the information out. But there is a negative side to getting some information out as well, which people don't realise. What's that? Well, it depends on the information that's coming out. I mean, if if all the information came out about Pizzagate and what really went on yeah. and the sickening things that went on, people would go, yeah, I'd prefer not to know. Thanks a lot. But, but you know, if, so, if I could just interject in relation to, to, to Pizzagate, this was, and this is just my own opinion on all of this, right? Now, I've no doubt that Pizzagate is a real issue that, that, that you know, the higher echelons of um, Washington is just replete with paedophiles. They're everywhere. You know all the paedophile scandals that come out throughout the 90s in this country and around yeah. the world about the priests and the Christian brothers and the nuns and all that sort of stuff? What no, I think they were doing was, by bringing it out and blaming them for all the abuse over the years, it desensitised everybody around the world to sexual abuse and stuff like that. And now that it's coming out about politicians and stuff like that, it's just gone over people's heads because we expect it. Well, in Germany, they're trying to actually uh, make it uh, legal that you can actually, um, you know, uh, be a, I won't say be a paedophile, but that you can go and, you know, do various things. To they're trying to designate it as a sexual orientation, way. isn't that right? Huh? They're trying to designate paedophilia as a sexual orientation, like being well, gay or being lesbian. Well, that, that's, the, that's the last... Um, the, that's the last uh, box that has to be ticked. Yeah. All right. The last they taboo, had the so homosexuality to speak. before that, and they had all the um, o o certain very sort of things. And over the years, it, everybody's been desensitised. And then this is the last thing that needs to be sorted: the paedophilia side. And they're saying that it's a sexual orientation, um, like homosexuality. Now, I'm not comparing both. Don't get me wrong. No, they're, they're not the same. They're two different things. Um, but they are trying to do that. They're trying to make us say, well, look, you know, it's just a, that's the way some people are and you just kind of, kind of have to accept it. And just because that's um, the way some people are, that doesn't mean anybody has to bloody accept it. That's the thing. Yeah, exactly. But this is what they're trying to do. This is the whole, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's that's where it's going. And to be honest with you, if we had another um, situation where we had another um, uh, Noah, Noah's flood, I wouldn't be surprised, in all honesty, because the way things are going at the moment, on a global point of view, with everything that's going on, the, 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 the earth does need a cleansing. It oh, really does need a shadow cleansing. Of a doubt. Yeah, it does. And I'm not sure how, it, or if, uh, if that's going to happen or when it's going to happen. I, I, I don't know. And um, you hear all different type of things. We you know you hear about Planet X and Uru and all that kind of stuff. Is it going to happen? And asteroids and the whole shebang. Yeah. Um, there are certain things you have to look at as well. And you know, why are the billionaires going off and, and buying land in New Zealand and making building silos and underground bunkers? And um, why does Russia have 5,000 underground bunkers um, for its people? And all these things are going on. And why do we have a seed fault in Norway? Um, yeah. And why why does you know George Bush and Angela Merkel have land down in uh, Uruguay um, and property down there? Um, so why are all these things going on if nothing's happening? Yeah, it, it make you wonder, all right. I, I mean, do they know is there something coming down the line that's going to affect the Northern Hemisphere, for example? Because as you just said, a lot of high-profile um, billionaires around the world are buying land as far south as possible. Yeah, totally. And I mean, one of the guys that we had on the show, he got an email from... Um, uh, Steve w w w uh, Wadowski from, you know, the Apple guy. Yeah. And he was very interested in what your man said about climate change. And unfortunately, what he said was very negative. And because Steve actually listened to the guy and looked at all the facts and everything else, he actually moved from America. And now he lives in Tasmania, which is an island off Australia. Yeah. 
So he moved all his family and everything down there because whatever is going to happen to the northern side, the northern part of the planet, everything seems to be safer down south. Mm, you'd wonder, all right, you know, I don't know. I mean, if something is going to happen, he's certainly not going to tell us about it anyway, that's for sure. So if anything does happen, it'll be a surprise for everybody unless it happens over a, a short period of time, like a few weeks or something like that, you know. Well, I'd put it to you, Mick, and put it to your listeners. If you were um, Trump or Obama or somebody on that level and you heard that something's going to be having a major effect on the planet or something's going to happen on the planet, um, I'm not going to say it's a pole shift, but say something's going to happen that's going to have massive effect on the planet and wipe maybe two-thirds of the people on the planet, would you go and, have, you know, knowing that you can't do anything, would you go and tell people, would you go on TV and tell people or just say, look, there's nothing I can do about it, so it's going to happen. So there's no point telling people. But see, that's, I mean, the, that's the, like the $64,000 question. You see that, that scenario coming up in movies as well. You know, do we tell the people or do we not? And the other argument is, well, the people have a right to know. And then the, I suppose the argument on the other side of that is, well, what's the bloody point in knowing? It's not going to make a blind bit of difference anyway, so why panic, and panic the people in the last hours or the last days, you know? Well, this is it, and you have to look at the, uh, what was the movie, 2012? Yeah, where, 2012, you know, yeah. Yeah, and people were being bumped off because they, because they had the information, and that's happened, like uh, uh, Harrington, um, he had uh, this fast-acting cancer, uh, Professor Harrington, who, who actually agrees with Planet X, Bob Dean is another um, a sergeant major, I think, or sergeant in the military, he's in his 80s now, I think he's still alive. Who was who was privy to all this information about you know what's going on? Now we've heard this kind of Nibiru Planet X thing over and over again. Yeah. Every September it's the same. Oh, it's this year. You know, 20, 20, uh, 2003, 2008, 2012, 2016. Now wasn't there some Iraqi government minister there recently mentioned Nibiru and said it That's was a real thing? Yeah. Well, I put a post up. I um, I actually came across that and I put the uh, the video up and. He came out and said it. And now, was he um, talking in Iraqi language like he's not talking English? Was the video translated and that's what's been said in the translation? Because I didn't watch it, I only heard about it, no. Well, uh, yeah, it, the video was translated into English. Right. Um, so I assume, I don't speak Iraqi, so I'm, I'm assuming he was saying what he was saying yeah. in the translation. Um, so, again, the question is, what, what do we do? I mean, maybe something's going to come. Now, I do know a couple of years ago, the Irish government did continuity of government testing between uh, the Dáil and Dublin Castle. Now, right. why would they be doing continuity of government testing a few years ago? For what reason? Are they expecting something to happen? Unless they knew something was coming down the line. You know, would you it wouldn't be, know. You know, and I'm not talking about anything celestial. It could be riots. It could be um, a breakdown of society. Maybe the banking system collapse or... Something going on. But this is what I'm thinking. That's the only thing that would um, panic the government into, you know, going into that kind of mode is a breakdown of society. You know, it, you know, there's no point in having continuity of government if there's an asteroid on its way to hear us because it's going to get us all. There won't be a continuity of government. But if society breaks down because there's no food in the shops and there's mass rioting, then, well, then they, they'll need the bunkers then to Definitely. continue the government, you know. Well, it'd be a Mad Max situation, wouldn't it? Well, I'd imagine it would be, yeah. Except it'd be raining here. <laughs> That's the only thing. Ah, uh, listen, I need to go to my last set of ads, so you hang on there for a minute or so, will you please? Okay, no problem. Brilliant, folks. Be back in a couple of minutes. We're on. Local programs, local presenters, local news. Tune to Lucky Sound 96.4 FM. Now, folks, you're very welcome back. Alan, you're still with me, aren't you? I am, yep. Now, um, I'm going to move on now a little bit, Alan. I don't know if you heard the news. Um, David Rockefeller passed away today. Oh, shame. I'll get the boiler. <laughs> Um, apparently he was 101 on his seventh heart and his 24th skin. Yeah, well, you know... And he's 6,000 um, years old. Yeah, well, I, I've no regrets uh, for that guy because he destroyed... He has destroyed the world in so many ways. He has as well. Him and, his, him and his ilk. Now, for those of you who don't know a lot about David Rockefeller, I've no doubt you've heard about David Rockefeller, who he is, and he's a billionaire in Chase Manhattan Bank and stuff like that, um, Standard Oil... David Rockefeller, in his memoirs, I think he released his memoirs in 2002, and in his memoirs he stated that he has been accused of being a globalist who his, has been trying for the last 50 odd years to bring about a one world government. He said, and that's the charge, he says, I stand guilty and I'm proud of it. 
So he yeah. basically admitted, yes, we are trying to bring in a one world government, and I'm proud of the fact that we are. And I think he also thanked all the media in the United States as well for keeping strum about with the last 50 years, because if he had a report on what they were doing, they wouldn't have been able to do what they do, or what exactly. they have done. Yeah. So you've yeah, no, um, you've got no regrets for him passing over to the other side, now. Well, he'd probably be recycled, and he'd probably be coming back in, you know, in another kind of, um, in another life, you know. I mean, we we won't, we don't have time to go into the the detail, Mick. But you know yourself, there's more to it. They have yeah. the, the archons. We could really go into that side of things and the whole recycling side of things. Um, so it, you know, that's just a body. And um, he'd probably be back in another body. Yeah, God knows what they've done with his conscience. They assume he had one in the first place. Well, he probably didn't have one, you know. And he, they called him a philanthropist. Uh, no, I don't think so. I think he probably, you know, he caused so much death and misery on this planet since he's since he's been a uh, since he's been alive. And um, just because he's dead, you know, doesn't mean that um, um, that everything he did stops. I mean, as he has family. They'll, they'll, they'll probably carry on. They'll carry on the legacy of doing exactly what the Rockefellers have been doing for over a hundred years, and that's guiding the world into, I suppose, a corporatocracy. Well, it, it would be, but what I'd say is, let's look at the positives. There's a lot of good stuff going on at the moment. All right, there's a lot of energy t- changes taking place, and a lot more people. You know, in the ten-year period between, I mean, we started OIM in 2010, and. We'll be uh, seven years this year uh, doing OIM. Seven years? And seven years. How right. long have you been... Oh, I'm on the air um, six years now, since 20, six years. 2011, yeah. Yeah, now, I, I do think for some reason this period of time between 2010 and 2020 is the most important and pivotal in society because we have gone from such a changeover, from even 2010, mm. to, you know, there's people that I know were asleep in 2010 yeah. and now they're wide awake. Exactly, yeah. I mean, I even look at what Trevor Evers pulled off there, right, and I, I hope he's listening in, fair play. The, the Open Minds Conference in Waterford, what an event. And for a group who only got together last year, Trevor put the page together, Awaken the World in South East Ireland with a couple of friends of his, because they were getting woken up to this information, and through shows like your own and shows like this and another forums like People's Internet Radio, etc., and they were learning about what's going on in the world, and within a year, a year, one year, they pulled off an event like that in Waterford. So what's yeah, that tell no. you? You know, I mean, we were on the air like five, six years ago and we were lucky to have a couple of people listening to us, assuming anybody was listening to us at all. Yeah. You know, yeah. so if you can see what they've achieved in just one year, I can only imagine what's going to be achieved by humanity over the next four years if the the ball keeps rolling in the direction that it has been rolling. You know, all the corruption that's going on, like not only in this country but around the world, it's been exposed left, right and centre. Yeah, yeah. But there is, there are, there are a lot of fights going on, and it's not just in this realm. It's not just in the 3D world, and that we don't have time to talk about it. But there is, there's a lot of um, dimensional fights going on, um, and um, that's just another subject, you know. That mm. we'll, w- w- what we'll probably do is uh, we'll probably get Thomas back on. Um, OIM and we'll go into detail because we haven't gone near that kind of stuff for a good few weeks now. We haven't gone near it. So we need to kind of get back into it and find out what's going on because this is not just like a 3D physical world. There's a lot more going on. Yeah, it's a spiritual yeah. world that's going on as well. Is there exactly big time. There really is. And all, and all this all this exposure of what's happening, change is inevitable. That's one thing we're guaranteed. We're guaranteed. Yeah. Change is inevitable. Change is going to happen. And that's what's happening now. Um, with the likes of what Trevor's doing and all his team down there with the seminars, hopefully they'll we'll get more seminars, more people waking up, more people going to the shows. The mainstream media have just become completely irrelevant. They're defunct now. They're not relevant anymore. No, they really ain't not. relevant. Definitely, definitely the lamestream media. You know, I wouldn't, you know, you know, Mick, without going into detail, we had a talk uh, one-to-one on Skype. And um, it was mentioned about uh, somebody going on mainstream media to advertise something. Yeah. And when I mentioned it to you, you said, you don't want to be going near them. Yeah. Because um, they'll do a hit piece on you. They've done it to, they've done it to Ben Gilroy. I mean, he's, he was on my show before talking about a hit piece that was done on him. And it's not just him. It's, it's, it's anybody that comes out with any sort of truth or something that goes against the grain as far as the official them goes. You know, they, they will lambaste you. You know, even if they know you're telling the truth, they will still call you a liar. Yeah. 
No, I, I don't have any. I don't have any issue if people are constructive in the criticism, or they have a couple of questions that you want asked. But if they entertain what we're saying, that's brilliant. I mean, we always mm. say that about the fluid belief system. And if they it can even entertain it, but does people that are black and white, it's true, it's not true. They just don't seem to have the ability to entertain it. You know, to ask yeah. the question, well, I'm not going to believe it, but I'll, I'll have a look at the facts and yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll investigate it and check it out. I, that's what I kind of look for in people. Yeah, well, isn't that the mark of an educated mind to entertain an opinion without necessarily accepting it? That's it. That's Aristotle. And that's that's it in a nutshell, you know. Mm. Um, and the uh, the height of ignorance is to condemn something without... Um, investigation. Uh, condemnation without investigation. Well, yeah, exactly. condemnation without so, investigation is the height of ignorance. So all these sayings are there for a reason. Um, yeah. I mean, and, the, the, these were stuff that were said by very wise people. Exactly. And that's why they're there. They're great sayings. And they're kind of... Well, I'm not really interested in so much the content. I'm more interested in how the people think and how they deal with something that goes against their belief system. Yeah. That's what I'm interested in. I'm not really... It doesn't matter whether it's UFOs, ETs, or dimensional stuff, or whether it's um, corruption in the banks and the fractional reserve system. It doesn't matter what it is. How does that person actually deal with something that goes against what they believe? Yeah. That's the trick. And if you kind of can... And what we do is, myself and Stephen, we've talked about this, analysing how that person thinks, how their mind works. And to some people, it's a closed mind, it's black and white, and that's it. Yeah. Other people will say, well, you know, I'll entertain it because, you know, I'll, I'm happy to challenge my belief system. Um, and then... So that's it. So it's about keeping an open mind. Not open enough where your brain will fall out, but open where you can actually entertain it. Well, you know what they say, Al, that the mind is like a parachute. It works best when it's open. Hey, that's it. Another great saying. What can I say? There you go. Full, it, you know? full of great so, quotes here tonight. They're all the quotes. But they're, they're all classic quotes. Yeah. And, you know, and, and they're there for a reason. They were, they were said for a reason because it says what you want to say in one sentence. You know, and... Um, and if people think about that, if you think, you know, take them sayings and, and read them over and over again, you kind of, hey, you know, that really makes sense. Yeah. But, you know, again, I was talking the other day to a neighbor of mine about energy and how important energy is. And even how, even thinking of something, you know, is energy. You, you know, it takes energy to think. Yeah, it does. And, and so, and I was talking to her about the Dale Carnegie um, the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, which I still think is a great book. And if anybody hasn't read it, I recommend you read it because it gets you thinking about how to rethink. The, the fight or flight syndrome for us is that when somebody attacks us, we attack back and we just yeah. go, rawr. And the Dale Carnegie thing is to kind of stop that and think about you know what's just happened and do it a different way. And we don't have time, unfortunately, to go into it. But if you, if you have 10 euros... Go to a shop, buy the book, have a read. They have great examples there of how you're using kind of reverse psychology. Yeah. Um, I use reverse psychology. Like, I have a four-year-old, Alan, and I use reverse psychology when I remember to do so. Um, <laughs> he, he can be quite testing and he can push and push and push. But, like, for example, today, you know, the last thing I needed today was to be stressed out. Um, I had a few things I had to deal with this morning, and like, I, I had a good day, don't get me wrong. But um, when I went home then... With my little four-year-old, every time he tried to get on my nerves, as it were, I just turn it around and it turn it into a game with him, and it, it sort of snaps him out of the little buzz that he does be on, you know? And it does yeah. work. Like, you can use reverse psychology on people, and it does work. That's it. And, you know, it's great when you didn't, we didn't do it with the kids as well. Yeah. Um, as I say, there's loads of examples in the book, and I could give you a few, but we don't have the time. Um, uh, or do we have time for one? Um, yeah, come on, give me one. We've got about five minutes left. Okay, I'll give you time for one. We'll talk about kids, right? Um, so um, the uh, this father has a has a new has a son, and it's a his next day of school. He has to go to school for the first time, and he's kicking and screaming, going, "I don't want to go to school! I don't want to go to school!" And it, you know, for some fathers, they go, "You're going to school, and that's it." Mm. And they pack him off and send him to school, and they, and his child's going to be kicking and screaming. So the father didn't do this. So what the father did was he got the rest of the family around the kitchen table. And they all start getting paint, and they all start finger painting on the table. And of course, the, the little kid came in and said, what are you doing? 
And uh, the dad said, well, we're all finger paint- painting and we're having fun doing all the finger painting. And he goes, can I do it? Can I do it? And the dad said, no, 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 you can't do it. To do this, you have to go to school. We all went to school to learn how to do it. Well, the next morning... He was up and ready to go to school. Dressed, ready to go to school. That's what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, and that is good psychology. You know, you, you, you're not, even though you are, you're tricking your child, so to speak, but you're doing it in a very good way, in a positive way. Well, in a love way, look, everybody does it. You know yeah. when you're on the couch and you might say to your partner, ah, oh, love, will you make me a cup of tea? Would you mind making me a cup of tea? That's still kind of manipulation. Yeah, but I, I moved the mug towards her. <laughs> Don't hold me now, just move, slide the mug gently across the couch and a few minutes later there's a cup of tea that manifests in front of me. It's <laughs> great. <laughs> That's how I do it. I think I'll probably get a chone at me. It works. Trust me, Al, it does work. You have to, like, subtle little hints, you know. Don't mention the word tea. Just move the mug towards her. Put the kettle on and let her hear it click. Oh, okay, okay. You know, these little things work. Hope she's not listening. She'll bite the head off me when I go home. (laughs) Yeah, I work on the manifesting. I think I'll do work on the manifesting. Oh, it's brilliant. You well, know. listen, one more thing I just want to cover. I don't know if you heard over the weekend about the debacle that was the GamerCon event in Dublin. No, I haven't Yeah, I was at it on Saturday. I bought my little lad tickets for that and we went and we were left queuing outside for two and a half hours at the convention centre, which holds 9,000 people. They sold 24,000 tickets for a two-day event and expected to cram the place full of people. Now, the fire marshals and all were called. Like, it became a health and safety issue. And this was just down to pure corporate greed. They wanted all the money they could make. And um, we got into the event all right, but it was so packed all, you couldn't even get to anything, to see anything in the place. It was a total farce from start to finish. Is that the one Steve, I think, brought his kids last year? And, um, he well, it wasn't on last year. This is the first time this has been staged in the country, you know, this game, gaming convention. Oh, I, I think Steve went to Comic-Con. Comic-Con, but that, that, they, that, that, that pulls off without a hitch. Comic-Con is very good. Yeah, but, but the thing is that they had a guy dressed up as, um, not Daredevil. Um, Deadpool. He, Deadpool. Yeah, and he was charging a five or a tenner. And when he, they didn't pay, they said, oh, no, you're okay. He um, said something to them, you know? Mm. Uh, well, uh, Deadpool was there now on Saturday now. And I got photographs taken with him and be little lad. Now, he didn't get any money out of me. But um, I got annoyed with the staff in the place because all the games that were there on the consoles, and there was about five or six hundred consoles, they were for all over 18 games. So there's nothing there for the young kids to do. And the games that were there for young kids were all tournament games. So you had to sign up to get onto it. It was ridiculous. Total waste of money going to this event. But um, hopefully they'll do it better next year. But as I said, it was down to pure corporate greed and nothing else. Yeah, I, I, no, I didn't know about it. And I'm just thinking now, would I have brought my son to it if I had a known that was on? He would have loved it. Assuming you got into the place and was able to have a look around. He would have enjoyed it, yes. Us yeah, okay. being outlets now, we wouldn't, all you know. But listen, yeah, Al, I have come to the end of the show. Unfortunately, I've only got a half a minute left, so I need to wrap okay. things up to play the intro. Thanks very much for coming on, Al. I really appreciate it. What a, a, a great interview. It was a good show. Thanks for having me, Mick. No, but I'd just I'll, like to just say a quick shout out to, if you want to uh, tune in to OAM, oamradio.com, every Sunday, 7 to 9. And what a show, brilliant show, one of the best talk shows in the country, folks. Don't be minding what you're hearing on the mainstream media. Tune in to Alan and Steve every Sunday on OAM. Cheers, Mick. Talk to you very soon, Al. Thanks very much. Take care, mate. Bye. And you, bye bye. Now, folks, that was Alan James from Open Your Mind Ireland Radio. And as, as Al said there, he's on airwaves every. Sunday night at 7 till 9 and he does have some great guests on absolutely brilliant guests it's a far out show it's a quirky show um, some quirky subjects trust me some very out, far out subjects UFOs and that type of stuff but um, always a very interesting listen listening to um, Alan and Steve it's a good two hour show as well unlike my hour twice twice the pleasure for for um, the single price anyway folks this has been The World You Don't Know and I have come to the end of the show and remember um, the world is full of fabulous people and if you can't find one be one until next time talk to us all very soon the very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret society, to secret oath, and to secret proceedings. Waking humanity, one soul at a time. This is The World You Don't Know Radio Show with your host, Nick O'Connell.